Good morning, New Hope Hala Eva. Woo! I know, yeah, look how nice our new logo is. Hey! If you're outside right now, I want to ask that you come in and invite you in as we get ready to worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords this morning. Amen. Clappers. 
dancing in the midst. In the midst of the darkest night, let your love be the shining light, breaking chains that were holding me. You sent your sign down and set me free. Everything of this world will change. I'm pressing on till I see your face. Church, just lift it up to him this morning. Never end it all. Sing, cause you are. Cause you are, you are, you are my freedom. We lift you higher, lift you higher. Your love, your love, your love never ends. give you all glory and honor this morning we lift you higher lord for what you did on the cross we lift you higher for what you're doing in our lives lord father we just lift up our praises to you god we just lift up our praises to you jesus
of righteousness And every eye beholds the one Our hearts were undeserving of With a grace so glorious Sing that one more time, church. Sing triumphant. Triumphant praises without end. All hailing the King of righteousness. That's it, church. And every eye beholds the one our hearts were undeserving of. In the grace so glorious. Continue to the last song. You just, just begin to just thank God for what He's doing in your life. Because when we're thanking Him, our attention is on Him. Thanking God naturally puts us in a place of worship because we're thanking Him. We're worshiping for what He's doing, for what He has done in our lives. Lord God, we just ask for more of Your presence. Church, if you feel comfortable, just raise your hands to the heavens, giving him all praise that he deserves. We surrender to you, God. We surrender to you, God. We thank you. God, we wait for you. We wait for you, God. We wait for you. We wait for you. We wait for you. To walk in the room. As the church just begins to sing that to him, sing, we wait. says, seek me and you will find me. We wait for you. Your people are calling. We wait for you. Your children cry out for you, Father. To walk in the room. Sing that one more time. Sing, we wait. We wait. Right. 
you are, for all that you've done, and for all that you will continue to do in our midst. We give you all honor and glory and blessing, Father God, that you may reign on high forever and ever and ever. And all of God's children in agreement said, amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, God is good in all the time and till would you extend God's goodness to your neighbor this morning? Good morning, Holly Eva. Welcome, welcome. Give it up for the worship band, worship team. Ooh, awesome this morning. What a glorious morning. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Welcome, welcome. My name is Jeff. I get the honor to do announcements today. And we're going to go ahead and start off with the connection card inside your bulletin. And if you haven't picked one up at the front, we have inside a connection card. If you're visiting us for the first time, we would love to get to know you and uh, your chance to put some information on there. There's some ministries that you might be interested in. And also, of course, on the back, we have our praise and prayer requests. And uh, we love to hear uh, people bring praise requests, what's going on in our church and the awesome things that are happening in, in uh, God's church and, and what's going on in um, here at this campus and also prayer requests we have prayer warriors that go over each and every one of these every week so be sure to fill one of these out and you can drop it off with the ushers on your way out okay and we want to just remind you that graduation and mother's day is coming up so in the back in our connection area we have the seeds table so if you're looking for maybe a gift 
for your Mother's Day or for grad, uh, go ahead and check out the seeds table back there in the connection area. And um, so we've got a video. Can we take a look at it? All right, let's go. Join us on Sunday, May 17th at 1 o'clock for our water baptism. Come out to Haleiwa to Ali'i Beach Park after service to celebrate what God is doing. Potluck will be provided, so join us for an afternoon of fellowship and celebration. See you there. All right, that's going to be coming up in just a couple weeks, actually, and um, just down the street from here. And that's going to be an awesome time. We always have a great time. Potluck. So, is it potluck? It is potluck, right? <laughs> Why not? We love food. Food, water, friends, family. It's, it's going to be a good time. Um, if you want to know what's going on here, especially at this campus, on the back of your bulletin it says happenings in Haleiwa. This gives you an idea of what's going on. In fact, coming up we have a couple of classes that are going to be uh, starting up soon. Uh, one of them is the New Believers class. Now the New Believers class, maybe you've just accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. Or maybe you're even just kind of trying to figure out what, what does it mean to be a Christian or what... What's, what's my next step? What do we do next? So we have our wonderful volunteers, Carl and Maureen King. They're going to be heading that up. And that's going to be starting on Sunday, May 24th, right after service from 11 to 1230. And uh, so that's a new believers class. If you want to sign up for that, you can go to the connection area or you can even write it down on your uh, connection card that you are interested in signing up for that class. Also coming up, we have another class, which is kind of like the next step after you do your new believers class. It's Grow with NHCO. This is for, for those of you who want to make New Hope Haleiwa your home church. Uh, this is a chance for you to find out what we're all about and uh, what we believe in. And, uh, oh, that's a good looking couple on there. Oh, it's me and my wife are going to be teaching that class. So if you want to join us. That starts on May 31st, so the week after the New Believers class starts. So they're going to be going on at the same time, but um, that's going to be also at 11 o'clock after service, and uh, we'd love to get to know you. For those of you who are new to this campus and want to make this your home church, come on and uh, join us, and we'd love to have you. And uh, I think that's it. So we're going to go ahead and ask our ushers to come up to the front, and um, this is our chance for our tithes and offering. And if you're visiting us for the first time, please don't feel obligated to give. Uh, just consider this uh, service as a gift to you. And for those of us who have New Hope Haleiwa as our home church, let's worship him now and pray. Father God, we thank you for all the wonderful gifts and blessings that you have provided for us. Lord, will you accept this, these tithes and these offerings as a worship unto you. Lord, will you use it to build your kingdom for your glory. We thank you so much that you have honored us with your blessings and we're just giving back just a little bit of what you've bestowed upon us. Help us to be good stewards of the things that you have blessed us with and to continue to praise you and give you all glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Registration for the Transformation Academy is now open. At New Hope Central Oahu, we've come to a realization. As awesome as Sunday morning is, you will not reach your full potential as a child of God just by going to church on Sunday. Wherever you're at in your walk with Jesus, God has so much more. So, so much more. So much more. So much more. Amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say so much more. It was good fun getting to make that video uh, at the staff meeting. Pastor Mike says, oh, by the way, I need your guys' help to do a video. I'm like, thank God the Holy Spirit told me to put some makeup on this morning. A little advance notice would have been nice, Pastor Mike. Usually I'm looking like a hobo when I go staff meeting. But I actually look good. I guess the Lord knew we were going to be doing that video. Um, but if you want to open up your bulletins, Kind of felt really thick today, yeah? 
I was like, oh, how come the bulletin's so thick? Well, then I remember, oh, yeah, get the new course catalog. Yay! Okay, so this is the registration form for the Transformation Academy. And you'll see all of our instructors in there and all the classes that you can register for. Please don't take too long to decide what class you want to take. Um, we have to prepare and make sure we coordinate with Pam Chun on um, facility usage. So whichever classes are the biggest number, obviously those are the classes that will be in the sanctuary. But there's also the course catalog. That's this bigger one. And that will tell you the different types of classes that are now available to take in the Transformation Academy. And if you can remember back to our last series, which was Lightning in the Bottle, and templing the Holy Spirit, we were sharing with you that Sunday mornings primarily is our opportunity to reach out to the lost, to reach out to our community, and to gather people into the body of Christ. And so we realize that you need to go deeper in your walk with Jesus. Can I get an amen? Raise your hand if ever you felt like, okay, I know God, I know Jesus, I know the Bible, Maybe not an expert at it, but you know, I know these things, but why do I feel like I'm stuck? Raise your hand if you ever felt like that, okay? I feel like that all the time. And normally when you feel like that, it's because you need somebody that's gonna help you get to your next glory. That's why it's so important for us to have spiritual mentors in our lives, spiritual coaches. And even for myself as a pastor, although I lead many people here in Haleiwa, I personally needed to seek out a spiritual mentor and a spiritual coach. So my two spiritual mentors and spiritual coaches are Pastor Mike, obviously, and Carol Miyashiro. And I have those two for very different reasons. And for, for many of you here, you have a spiritual coach as well. If you don't have a spiritual coach, I want you to, and you want one, if, if you don't, because if you, if you don't want one, then don't seek it out. Please don't seek out a spiritual coach if deep down inside you really don't want one. Because that means your spiritual coach is going to invest in you and it's going to fall on deaf ears. You're not going to listen to them anyways. It's a waste of your time and it's a waste of their time. Not everybody is ready for a spiritual coach. And it's okay. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's okay. Don't feel pressured to do this because someone's telling you you need a spiritual coach. You want the Lord himself to say, it's time. It's time. You need to go find somebody. Because even the Bible, it says, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Right? So you're not necessarily ready for a spiritual coach. But if you feel the Lord is telling you that's what you need, you need a spiritual coach, you need somebody who's going to help guide you, you need somebody that's going to hold you accountable to what God is trying to do in your life, then, and you don't have one, I want you to fill out the communication card and simply put your name, your contact information, and just put, I want a spiritual coach. And our prayer team and our staff is going to begin to pray and intercede. Somebody will contact you, and we're going to make sure you have somebody that you're tracking with in our church, okay? If you already have a spiritual coach or a spiritual mentor, as you go through this course catalog, you want to first and foremost ask the Lord which class you're supposed to take. Now, remember, there's 100 series, 200 series, 300 series, 400 series. It goes all the way up to seven, right? That doesn't mean every single one has to be taken in order, okay? We want you to go where you feel the Lord is leading you, but we want you to ask your spiritual coach to confirm that. Because sometimes you think you need something, and really you need something else. Can I get an amen? For example, I may feel like all I need to do to get into shape is to walk twice a week for 15 minutes. Well, I'm not going to trust myself because I know nothing about physical health. So I'm going to ask somebody I know is a professional in that, and I would call Frida. Frida, I think I need to just walk for 15 minutes twice a week. And Frida was like, oh, that's good. She's so gracious. That's good, Pastor Teresa. That's a good start. But what you really need to do is resistance training. And then, of course, under my breath, I was like, dang it. But, you know, I can help you with that. We have rubber bands. Okay, now they're trying to get me rubber bands. Okay, God surrounds me with beautiful people. Okay, so you want to ask a coach where you should be. Okay, in the course catalog, some of these classes have prerequisites. Turn to your neighbor and say prerequisite. All that means for those of us that have not been in college for a while is you can't take that class without something else. Okay, for example, my class. Okay, my class is on the back. My class is Life Skills for Leaders, Transformation 650, okay? Everybody in this room is a leader. 
that doesn't necessarily mean you want to take my class, okay? For those people who know me, this is not the class if you want to come to and like just feel good about yourself. My job is to challenge you, okay? Because this is senior leadership kind of training. Senior leadership kind of training. So Pastor Mike, I thought anybody could take my class. And then Pastor Mike said, no, 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 Teresa. This needs to be, I know what this class is. You don't know it yet, but I know what this class is. I'm like, oh, okay. This, that's why I have a coach. Because I was going to let anybody take this class. He said, no, that needs to be pastor recommended. Okay, so anybody from Wahiwa campus that's going to take my class, Pastor Lori has to recommend them first. Anybody from Mililani that's going to take my class, Pastor Mark or Pastor Earl or Pastor Mike has to recommend them to take my class. Let me just give a disclaimer. That doesn't mean my class is the class of all classes. That just means that we want to make sure that not only are you spiritually ready for this class, you're emotionally ready for this class. Okay? Because if you're not emotionally ready for this class, you might walk away feeling hurt or like discouraged. That's not what the class is designed for. The class is to take that leader who's ready to take a step farther and truly become a living sacrifice. Okay, and that's, that's been my whole life's journey. So that's why I'm teaching this class, okay? For our, I, I prayed about this and I confirmed this with Pam, you know, just to make sure I wasn't sidestepping because I tend to do that. Um, I felt awkward having to recommend somebody from my own campus to take my class. That just seemed weird to me. So Glenn doesn't know it yet. And that sucks, sucks to be him. I'm sorry. He's not here. We asked the Lord and he's going to be the one. So before you can take my class, Glenn is going to have to give a recommendation. I don't think I should recommend you to my own class. Glenn will recommend whether or not you can be in my class. Okay? Because that to me seems weird. That I would go, oh, you can be in my class, but you can't be in my class. You know what I mean? Like, I know that this is going to take very much great maturity in the body of Christ. Because if you don't get invited to my class this time around, don't worry. I'm going to teach the class next year. I'm going to teach it every year. We want you to take which class is best for you in this time of your life. In this season of your life, we want you to take the class that God is calling you to take. All of us, turn to your neighbor and say all. Turn to your, another, your other neighbor and say that's including the pastors. Need to take every class. Okay, so you may be sitting here and you see Pastor Lori's class is recognizing and overcoming the giants in our lives. Okay, you're seeing that and you're thinking, oh, well, I think that I'm okay and I don't, I, don't, I don't need to do that. This is our bronze basin, our bronze altar. This is where you're being sanctified. Trust me when I tell you, you're going to visit this class a lot. You may take this class once, five years from now, you're going to have to take it again. Because the Holy Spirit will reveal new giants in your life. I think Joyce Myers was the one who said, new level, new devil. Okay, new level, new devil. So as you grow and you transform into the image and likeness of Christ, as you grow and you transform in your influence for Christ, as you grow and you transform in your leadership for Christ, there's new things you got to overcome. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. Church, I want us to embrace that. That's what it means to be transformed, that we are constantly growing and changing. You will never arrive. You will never finish until Jesus Christ comes back and demolishes sin once and for all. Until that day comes, you're going to constantly be going through Transformation Academy. Can I get an amen? Okay. So I just want to encourage you. Um, we have registration all, all month. Um, I think classes start in June. So Pastor Mike is rolling this ball. I mean, as a staff, we're like, oh, we're, 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 this is happening. You were, you're like ready to move. The rest of us aren't ready to move. Pastor Mike's like, no, we're ready to go. Holy Spirit said, let's do this. Um, so please register early. The beautiful thing is it's free. It's free. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's free. And let me tell you, some of these courses, if you went to... A Bible college would cost you like $600. The class, for example, I only know my class, but the class I'm teaching is actually Pastor Wayne's curriculum. To take that class with Pastor Wayne, you're going to pay, what is the credits at New Hope Christian College? What, what is it? Does anyone, does anybody know? Like six or $900, I think. $300 credit, I think. Like $1,000 for this class, just to take this class. You folks are going to get this curriculum for free. Because I have the curriculum. Pastor Wayne put it in this nice little binder. I'm like, yes. 
He did all the work. I just have to follow. I'm like, yeah, I can't fail. I cannot fail. Hallelujah. That's the only reason why I agreed to teach at the academy. <laughs> I'm like, okay, you mean I can't screw up? Okay, I'll do it then. I'll do it, you know? So just know that this is a wonderful resource that God is trying to present to the body. But we can take the horse to the water. We can't force the, the horse to drink, right? You got to want and desire with all your heart to grow. It will take a commitment, obviously. Anything that's going to bear fruit is going to take a commitment. And for you, if you're here and you've got way too much on your plate right now, um, especially like I'm thinking, I know some people that are in college, they're like stressing about finals and papers and everything else they got to do. Don't feel pressured out to take a class right now. It's okay. It's okay. Maybe it's not your season. It's okay. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's okay. Okay, what I don't want to happen is everybody start going, well, I'm taking this class, how about you? And then that person feels all guilty because they're not in the class. You know what I mean? Just know that everybody is in their own season and seek out what the Lord would have you do based on what you can handle at this time in your life. Can I get an amen? If you have any questions about the Transformation Academy, you can see me after church. Um, just today, especially, keep it short. I already have one appointment for somebody after church. So don't pin me and like want to talk an hour about every single class because honestly I wouldn't be able to tell you about every single class I, I don't know all about the classes I only know about my class um, but if you have some questions I think I can answer some introductory kind of stuff about those classes but that's about it if you want more information detailed information about that class you could contact the pastor who is listed to teach that class they may have a syllabus ready for you um, to show you what you'll be doing in the class I know for myself, my class is going to require homework. Again, it's a commitment. There's required reading and there's assignments you have to turn in. I'm not going to give you a grade necessarily, but I'm going to track your homework um, because it is an academy. It is to help us to grow. And the homework is primarily just to hold you accountable. That, that's all it is, to make sure you're getting everything you can be getting from the class. Okay? With that, would you take out your notes? I'm excited this morning as we conclude our transformed series how God changes us. I remember at the beginning of 2015, the prophetic word that God downloaded into my heart was change. How many of you remember that? Raise your hand if you remember the prophetic word for change. Okay. And I didn't know we were going to be doing this series. That's how good God is. I did not know we were doing this series. What I want to do right now is by the showing of hands, we've already gone six months into the year, okay? Six more months and we're going to be at the new year again, okay? So honestly now, raise your hand. I'll count to three so you have time to think about it. But I want you to raise your hand if you experience some kind of change this year already. One, two, three. Look at that. Look at all the hands that went up. Okay, the only reason why I'm doing that is because I just want to give God glory for what he's doing in our midst. It's not about me doing a prophetic word, which that, that's God in himself, that, that I heard that. But that we can celebrate that God is being true to his word. He told us that he was going to take us into a year of change, and so many change is happening. And I would contend that even if it doesn't look like good change, it is. Because God is a good God. And so you may not be able to see the goodness yet, but trust me, on the other end of it, there'll be goodness. You'll find it. You'll see it. Okay. This morning, we are going to conclude our series talking about facing giants in life and work. And this is uh, the last s s service for our Transform series, and it is designed to talk to you about your career. Okay. But as I was preparing for the message... It is not only going to talk about your career, but the truths that we are going to wrestle with today can be applied to all areas of your life, okay? So I want you to be able to hear God speak to you about whatever you need to be sp spoken to. If, if you have, you're here and God knew you were going to be here, so he, he chose this career message for you, then hallelujah, be, be receiving whatever I'm saying in, in regards to your career. But maybe you're here and you're struggling in your marriage, okay? Well, then receive the truths that we're going to learn today for your marriage. Maybe it's a relational thing, or maybe it's an emotional thing, or maybe it's a financial thing. We've gone through a lot of different messages, right? 
Today, in essence, what we're going to talk about is how to overcome the giants in our lives in regards to that kind of stuff, okay? So first, I want you to write your notes. Great achievements begin with a dream, but we let obstacles stand in our way. Great achievements begin with a dream, but we let obstacles stand in our way. If you have your Bibles, we are going to be reading a very familiar Bible story out of 1 Samuel chapter 17, and that is about David and Goliath. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of a David and a Goliath, okay? And many of us will admit we have obstacles in our life. If you've never faced an obstacle in your life, man, we need to talk. I want to know what life you're living. But as believers, we are told and we are instructed that we are going to have trials and tribulations. That comes with being a believer, right? And so this morning, we're going to learn from David how he overcame his giant, which was Goliath. And I'm going to start reading at 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 1. The Philistines now mustered their army for battle and camped between Soko and Judah and Azekah at Ephes Damim. Saul countered by gathering his Israelite troops near the valley of Elah. So the Philistines and Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with a valley between them. Then Goliath, a Philistine champion for Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. Say to your neighbor, nine feet tall. Turn to the other neighbor and say, that's a big brother. He wore a bronze helmet and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was, a heavy, and thick, was heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield. Goliath stood and shouted and taunt, a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight, he called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. They were terrified and deeply shaken. I'm going to stop right there. So basically what's going on is you have the Philistines on one side, you have the Israelites on one side, they're trying to go over, the Philistines are saying, nope, that ain't going to happen. They have a ginormous of a man named Goliath. He comes out and he's basically talking smack to the Israelites. He's talking smack to them and he's saying, yeah, 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 uh, 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 you can imagine. In, I'm not going to say what they would say in today's society because today's society has kind of not so nice language. Um, but the bottom line is he's saying, let's just end it all. Instead of us all fighting each other, let's go one on one. You take your biggest guy against our biggest guy and whoever wins, the other camp has to basically bow down and become slaves. So here we are. The Israelites are, are they have a promise. They're trying to get to a promise. They have a dream. They're trying to get to the dream. And David himself is a man who has great um, desires and dreams. And they come to this point where they face a giant, okay? In your notes, we have what's called dream breakers, okay? Now, I, I changed that so you can retitle that dream stealers, okay? Dream stealers. The other giants David faced. Not only did David had to face Goliath, the human giant, but there were other giants that he had to face. And the reason why I want to call them dream stealers is because when you say dream, dream breakers, I think the ideal comes from a deal breaker. You know how people say, oh, it's a deal breaker. And to me, when you say deal breaker, it kind of is real final. It's, it's done. With the dream stealer, Somebody is trying to steal your dream, trying to steal your vision, trying to steal your destiny. But you can turn that around in Jesus' name. Can I get an amen? Okay, so David himself had to face a bunch of dream stealers too, dream breakers. Okay, and the first one he had to deal with was delay. Delay. 
Okay? Now, verses 12 through 15 says, Now David was the youngest of Jesse's eight sons. Okay? David was the youngest. Turn to your neighbor and say, David was the youngest. His three older brothers enlisted in Saul's army. So David is the youngest. He's the, the, the grunt of the litter, if you will. His three older brothers, they enlisted into Saul's army. But David was held back to care for the sheep in Bethlehem. Say, held back. Okay? First, we need to realize that every great achievement begins with an imagination. Your imagination will become a dream. Your dream will be fulfilled, but everything starts in your imagination. You and I were created in the image of God, therefore we are creators. We are never more like God than when we are creating, okay? Napoleon once said, imagination rules the world. Einstein once said, imagination is more important than knowledge. So your imagination is very important. If you cannot conceive it, you cannot believe it, then you will not achieve it. So you have to be able to conceive it in your mind. Whatever it is your dream is, you have to be able to conceive it in your mind. For example, Glenn and I were able to conceive in our mind that we wanted to be in a single family home. We didn't know how that was gonna work. We just had a dream that we are gonna move out of townhouse living where I can hear my neighbor flush. And we are going to be in a bigger home with a yard because we wanted to have a garden. Okay, once we could imagine it, we can believe in it. We're like, okay, we don't know how it's going to happen, but I know God knows how it's going to happen. So my faith says it's going to be done some way, somehow. The Lord will show me how we're going to get this house. We've been believing for this house for over seven years. Seven years, brothers and sisters. When we bought our first house, all we could afford was a townhouse because we were in debt. I did not know how would we ever buy a home, a single family home in the state of Hawaii. But I imagined it in my mind. And I thought about it all the time. And I told the Lord, oh, how awesome it's going to be when we finally get a house and I can walk around my whole property. And I imagined what I wanted in my house. I knew I wanted a fireplace. Who, it's rare that you get a house with a fireplace. Y'all are smiling, right? I'm like, okay, I live in the islands. It's hot, and yet I want a fireplace. I just always knew I wanted one. I thought, okay, God, you know, I'm just telling you what I want. This is what I'm imagining in my mind. I knew that it would be like a cottagey house. I knew it would have exposed beams. I knew that I would be able to walk around the whole perimeter of the house. Forget the zero lot line thing. I wasn't having that. I, I want to walk around the whole perimeter of my house. I knew it had to have grass, which is rare in Hawaii too. But I wanted grass because I'm, I'm from the mainland, right? I, I see those houses. I knew that it had to have a space for my garden. I knew that I wanted these, um, like, kind of like um, ranch, you know, like a ranch house. You have all this exposed wood and all these beans. I knew I wanted that. I knew I wanted to have the, like, these little hooky things where you can hang, like, potted flowers because I wanted to see flowers. I mean, I knew all these things that I wanted, right? And none of it made sense because, I mean, we were in debt. All we could afford this townhouse. And, but I imagined it. And I believed, not in the fact that Glenn and I could get this house, but I believed that God could. And because I believed in him, we achieved it. Now, I would have never guessed that the way we would have done that was something horrific. And I'm going to share this with you because the first point is, I know you're thinking, Pastor Teresa, what are you talking about? You're all over the place. I want to share with you because the first point is delay. Okay? Back in three or four years ago, I don't remember now, my sister died. She was killed in a car accident. Many of you guys were in the congregation when that happened. She's my older sister. It was a tragedy. Uh, and I remember we had just planted the church and my sister was killed in this car accident. And I'm thinking, what is going on here, God? We're doing the Lord's work. We're, we're building your kingdom. I'm out here on the North Shore with my husband by faith. And six months later, my sister dies. And I'm questioning, like, what in the world is that, right? Protect my family, oh, Lord. And she's in Colorado. She dies. And I have never been more challenged in my faith than I was in that moment. And I'm not saying it was the will of the Father for my sister to die. I'm not saying that. What I, what I am saying is that God, 
knows what's going to happen from the beginning to the end. He knows the alpha from the omega. He knows it all. And what I'm saying is he took a situation that could have destroyed my family and turned it around and made it good. Because of that, my parents now live in Hawaii. Because of that, my brother is now saved. And because of that, I was able to pay off my debt. Why? My sister left an inheritance to my dad. My dad said, I can't take all this money. I need to know I did something for her siblings to make this worth her passing. So he paid off our second mortgage. He paid off my brother's second mortgage. It was a lot of money. And he, he didn't use any of it for himself. I said, Daddy, Vivian left you this money because she wants you to have a home. And I know more than anything, she'd want you to live in Hawaii. Use the money. Now he lives in Hawaii. He bought himself a home in Hawaii. Beautiful home in Kapolei. And because we paid off our house, paid off the second mortgage, there was a lot of equity in our home. So when we sold our townhouse, we had a whole bunch of equity. We used the equity to pay off all the bills. All the bills gone got us this single family home. Okay? But it was not without delay. Seven years of waiting to get out of debt and to buy this single family home. I would have never guessed in a million years that's how God would have done it. And I could have been, I could have allowed the delay to make me give up on the dream of having a single family home. Well, it's been seven years. I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. That's okay. I can just stay in the townhouse and be satisfied. You know how you start talking to yourself about, okay, well, I guess townhouse living is better than nothing because there are some people that don't even own homes. I'm thankful that at least I own a home, right? That's not how our God works. God puts something in your heart. He wants you to believe in him for it. He doesn't want you to waver because there's a delay. Can I get an amen? Okay. Everybody needs a dream for their life. Everybody needs a vision for their life. The Bible tells us that man without vision will perish. Okay? Without a dream, we drift. Without a dream, we drift. What do I mean by that? That means you will end up doing something that you were never even created to do. If you don't have a plan, then the world will take you where they want you to go. Can I get an amen? We as pastors spend a lot of our energy encouraging people to go after their dreams, to go after their vision, to go after their calling, okay? The calling that God has put in their heart despite what's going on around them. Unfortunately, for every 10 people we encourage, nine of them are afraid. Nine of them get discouraged. Nine of them lose faith. Okay, they let the problems, they let the circumstances stand in their way. They look at what they see and they say, it cannot be. We're supposed to look at what we don't see and say, it can be. That's faith, right? Not looking at we, what we see and say, it cannot be. We're supposed to look at what we don't see. What don't we see? We don't see God Almighty. We don't see all of the resources in heaven. We don't see that he is a master of creation. We don't see that he knows the beginning and the end, and we don't see how he's working it out for our good. You can't see that, but yet we have to believe that it can be. And not only that, we have to speak it to be. Can I get amen? All right, and that sometimes it's hard. Too many people feel like their giants are blocking them from achieving their dream, for, from achieving their destiny, for achieving their great desire in their heart. Maybe it's a financial uh, a blockage. Maybe for me and Glenn, it was a financial barrier. It was a financial giant. Because in the state of Hawaii, who buys homes for $600,000, for goodness sakes? I mean, and that's not even, like, the median price of a home is seven fifty. Like, who does that? And you don't do that on a pastor's salary for sure. You know what I'm saying? So for us, it was a major financial giant that could have discouraged us. And at times, it did discourage us. Maybe it's a relational giant you're facing. Maybe you know you're called to do something. You know you're supposed to have this job. You know you're supposed to be in this place. But there's a human being there that just, ugh, you're just like, ugh. And you just can't get past the relational issue with that person. So it stops you. It stops you from going to where you're supposed to go because you avoid. You avoid that person. I, I'm, I, I'm, not a I'm not a person that likes confrontation, so that's okay. I don't like go there now. I'm just going to go over here. Okay? Let me make it realistic. Maybe you're called to do, um, because he has a self healthy self-image, I'm going to use Nate. Is that okay? You're, you're, you're confident in the Lord. 
Let's say you wanted to be in um, Children's Ark. Okay? Let me use Chris. Chris is my longtime son. Chris wants to be in Children's Ark, but he can't stand Nate. He's just like, oh, I don't, I don't, don't know if I can serve with that guy. He's like, like on crack all the time. He's just a little too hyper for me. He's just always excited, you know, and I'm like, mm, I don't know about that. And he's like, eh, that's okay. Although Chris may know he was designed and destined to disciple little children, he'll walk away from it because of that relational giant. Instead of confronting the relationship and saying, God, fix this. God, overcome this giant. God, break this wall down for me so that I can walk into my destiny. Are you with me? So we have financial giants. We have relational giants. Maybe it's emotional giants. Maybe your thing that has stopped you from reaching the fullness of Christ is your emotional instability. That was me. I was an emotional basket case. I was up, down, in, out. I was doing loop-de-loops. I don't even like roller coasters, but I was just up and all over the place. And I'm just glancing like going, can we get something from my wife, man? Like, can she just chill out? I can't handle her emotional, right? Because men, don't, they don't do well with that, right? And I had to learn how to crucify my emotions to the cross. And I'm just like, you know what? I feel this way, but it is not truth. That is not who I am. This is who I am, right? But you have to overcome that giant in your life. And it, these are real battles people are facing. Maybe it's physical. Maybe it's a physical battle where you um, can't even get to church regularly, because you're battling some physical illness. I don't, I don't know. That's a huge battle for people. But the enemy wants to use that as a giant in your life to stop you from entering into your promise. Can I get an amen? And obviously, we know we have spiritual giants. You know, for a lot of people, it's the word of God. It's a spiritual giant. Well, you know, pastor, I read the Bible and I, I get nothing. I don't even understand what they're talking about when I read the Bible. How can I grow in my spiritual walk when I open it up, I read one paragraph, I'm done. Okay, that's a spiritual giant. That is a spiritual giant that God wants to help you overcome. So now we know there are spiritual giants like delay. What do you do? How do you face these giants in your life, in your work, whatever circumstance it is? Well, that's what we're going to learn from David today. But first, we need to talk about the giants that David faced that were not just Goliath, okay? So we're not going to talk about Goliath himself. We're going to talk about underlying giants that David faced. And that first one was delay. That is when your dream is not fulfilled instantly. There's a time gap. For us, it was seven years to achieve this house. By the way, the number seven, there's significance in the number seven. In Hebrew culture, the number seven means completion. So I thought, wow, we've been in this townhouse for seven years. The Lord said, it is complete. Move into your new glory. Hallelujah. So I don't know where you are in your gap. Do not let delay discourage you and rob you of your dream or your destiny. There's always often a waiting period in order to move into God's promises. In David's case, we read that he was held back. Remember? His dad held him back. Okay? He was supposed to stay and take care of the sheep. So he was held back. David didn't think, um, da David's dad didn't think David was old enough. He didn't think that David was experienced enough to leave his job as a shepherd, taking care of the sheep, and become a king, or to go fight in Saul's army. So he was held back. In your situation, maybe you've been waiting for a promotion. Maybe you've been waiting for God to turn your marriage around. I don't know. And there's been a delay. You just don't see the fruit of it coming. And you're like, when is it going to ever come? I want to encourage you, do not let delay rob you of your dream. Because sometimes what happens, you might be in year five. And you say, enough's enough. I'm not even going to believe in this anymore. And two more years would have got you your promotion. Okay? So that's your first delay. We're going to jump down to verse 12 if you're following along with me. It's in your notes. It says, now David was the youngest of Jesse's eight sons. His three older brothers enlisted in Saul's army, but David was held back. Circle the words held back to take care of the sheep in Bethlehem. The first barrier to your dream is when somebody holds you back. Some of you 
because of your age, because of your race, because of your gender. You can look at any kind of discrimination, for that matter, are being held back from what you were called to do. That is your first giant that you are facing. True testimony. When I left the Catholic Church, I thought my mom would like go into her grave. Seriously, I didn't know how she would receive me leave, leaving the Catholic Church because I was born and raised Catholic. I loved my Catholic faith. I served the Catholic Church. You know, I sang when I was Catholic, sang different kinds of songs, but I sang when I was Catholic. And when I left the Catholic Church, I thought my mom would roll over. I thought she, she would just like lose it. And I, I'll be honest with you, she was disappointed. She was. And, but she didn't question me. She said, I'm just glad you're going to church. I don't, I don't care how you do it. Just make sure you're following God. And I thank my mother for that. It wasn't until some time, some years later, that my mom and my dad came to visit um, to Hawaii, because at the time they were not living here. And I remember my mom and my dad came to the Sunday service, and, it, and God is a good God. Out of all the weekends she could have came with my dad to visit, it was the weekend I was giving one of my first messages I was ever going to preach. Okay? It was one of my messages that I had to birth on my own. I had to wrestle with God. I remember working on this message at seminary with Kenneth Ulmer, who's like an amazing preacher. And I remember at seminary the week before he laid hands on me, he said, Teresa, I pray anointing on you. Go and preach the word of God. And I'm telling you all of the power of God came on me. Like God was setting me up for this day. And I thought, oh my gosh, I've never preached like this in front of my dad. I wasn't so much worried about my mom, but I was really worried about my dad. I'm like, because, you know, they, all they knew was Catholic. And they come to this church service, and I preached like I have never preached before. I mean, it was an out-of-body experience, I'm telling you. Like, I felt like I stood on the side and watched myself preach this message. I was like, oh, my, did that just happen? It was the first time that I truly felt the anointing and power of God just take over. And I delivered this message, and some of you might have been sitting there. If you were, I showed a video with Mufasa. I don't know if you remember that, but anyways, it was amazing, this message. And, and, and it wasn't because of me. I, truly, it was, it was the anointing of God. And the whole time, I was afraid. I was so afraid because, you know, I didn't know what my parents thought of me doing this. Because in the Catholic Church, women don't do this. Women do not do anything except for the little, little women things that they let you do. Right? And so I thought, okay, I don't know if my parents are going to agree. They may not think that I'm ready for this. They may only know the Teresa that grew up in their house. And they may say, you're not qualified to be a spiritual teacher. I'm, I'm like wrestling with all that. And then I just felt God say, trust me. And so I just surrendered. I said, you know, Lord, I'm going to surrender. I preached this message. I kid you not. My dad came up to me after church. I have never seen this man cry the way he cried. I mean, Hanabada kind of crying. And he's crying, and I thought, oh, God, I offended him. I did something wrong. I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know, and I'm, I'm getting nervous because he's approaching me. He's crying, and he said, I have never been more proud of you than I am in this moment. I came undone because that's all I wanted was for my parents to understand why I had to leave the Catholic Church. My mom came up to me later. She said, I know why you had to leave the Catholic Church. I approve. You will never do this kind of work for the Lord in the Catholic Church. I said, Mom, thank you. And ever since that moment, they have supported my ministry. That's all that matters to me, is that my parents are behind me and my Heavenly Father's got my back. Because to this day, I'm discriminated against. I preached another message shortly thereafter, faced another giant. We had a family leave our church because I was a woman who preached the Word of God. I remember spending a year dealing with my emotions over knowing that God was calling me to be a minister of the word and yet feeling, number one, inadequate, number two, unknowledgeable, and number three, I was a woman. And you throw in whatever it is for you. Maybe you feel like you're too young. Maybe you feel like you're too old. I don't know. For me, I was, I was a woman, and I didn't know if men could receive truth from me as a woman. Then there's all the debates in the Bible that where Paul says women shouldn't teach men, I mean, I, I can go on and on and on about the year debate that I went through. But you know, God is a good God. He planted Glenn and I in a four square church. I knew nothing about four square. I just knew that this was the church God wanted us to go to. And I found out later that the four square church was founded by a woman. 
I found out later that not only did this woman start this denomination, she had an amazing preaching ministry. She had an amazing healing ministry. It's ridiculous what this woman accomplished for God. She was the first woman to create Christian broadcast radio and started evangelizing. On, and I felt like God saying, I got you. I know where I'm taking you. Believe in me. Do not worry about your delay. Do not worry about the people who are trying to hold you back. Trust me. Trust in me and me alone. Don't trust your husband. Don't trust your boss. Trust me and me alone. I know what I'm going to do through you if you continue to trust and believe in me. Wait on me. Surrender to me. Here we are 14 years later and we planted a church. And I have to preach every other Sunday with my husband. And the last time I checked, the people that are here, they're okay with me being a woman. <laughs> Praise Jesus. And if they're not okay, sorry Vance. Transparent, but y'all don't want to see Mahana bought us. The last time someone came into our church and they were unsure of me preaching as a woman, I, I prayed blessings over them. It's okay. I, I pray blessings over you. There's a church for you. That's why God has lots of them. I pray you find the church you're comfortable in. All that to say is you can't let those kinds of things rob you of your dream. You can't let those kinds of things be a deal breaker for you, and you cannot let those things steal your dreams. Can I get an amen? Sometimes it's your closest friends and family that are going to hold you back. Sometimes it's your coworkers. Sometimes it's your boss. Sometimes it's yourself. You can hold yourself back. Can I get an Amen. David's dad was the one who wanted him to be a shepherd when God's plan for David was for him to be a king. But David's dad couldn't see that in him. Now here's the story changer. David's dad decides to have David deliver a care package to his older brothers who are fighting on the front line in Saul's army. While there, David hears about Goliath. He also sees how frightened everyone is, Okay. That leads us to the next deal breaker. That leads us to the next dream stealer. Okay? Write in your notes, the next giant that David had to face was discouragement. Discouragement. Everyone was afraid. Goliath had created a climate and a culture of fear. Why? Because he came out every day and he was taunting everybody. He was demoralizing everybody. Everybody was gripped with anxiety. They were terrified. They were traumatized. They were hopeless. They were so frightened they could do nothing. Does that sound like some place you work? I had a boss like that once. God, he wasn't a believer and I was a believer. And he just, the work environment was just, Toxic. He was toxic to work there. Right? And I had to wait on God before I could leave that place. I waited and waited. And Glenn's like, when are you ever going to leave? I'm like, I cannot leave until the Lord says I can leave. Obviously, the day came. So if you're in a toxic place, just know God is getting ready to deliver you. Okay? But everybody was frightened. They were so full of fear. When you are in a place like that, it attacks your belief it attacks your faith okay it makes you feel like it's impossible it's never going to turn around but here comes David this little kid who walks in he doesn't know it can't be done childlike faith when you see children they are like bonsai they don't even know that it can't be done I look at my son Emmett, this is childlike faith right here. My bed in my bedroom is really high. Like, think of the normal size height of a bed, bed and think like a foot higher than that. Okay, that's high off the floor for a, a, a baby, right? This kid does not know it cannot be done. In his mind, because he can get off the couch, he thinks he can get off this bed. And I said, Glenn, watch him. We put him on the bed on purpose to see what he would do. We put him in the middle of the bed, and we kind of backed away just to see what he would do. And he looked around, and he, he turned himself around, and he scooted his feet off the bed like this, like go backwards so his feet would go first. 
And I'm like, Glenn, catch him. He just was going to drop to the floor. He could have broke his ankle. He could have broke his arms. He could have broke his face. He just didn't even think it was not impossible. He just like, no, it's possible. Okay, this is David. David walks into the camp. Everybody else is terrified. Everybody else says it's impossible. They're looking at this giant. They're like, no way. There's no way we can do this. And David walks in, this grunt of a child, and says, what is everybody's issue? I, I don't get what the problem is here. Why is everybody backing away from this situation? Everybody else is giving up, and David's going, just go take him out. What's the problem? What? I, Face the giant. Get rid of it. Come at it. Head on. Knock the wall down. Blaze through it. This is, this is where David is. Why is there two difference in those people? Well, the Israelites' army was listening to the wrong voice. David only heard the voice of the Lord. He wasn't looking at circumstances. He was listening to the voice of the Lord. In verse 16, it says, For 40 days, twice a day, morning and evening, the Philistines' giant loudly berated the Israelites' army. That's all they heard. All they heard was Goliath berating them. All they heard was Goliath instilling fear in them. All they heard was Goliath taking down their faith. Ask yourself this question this morning. Who are you listening to? Who says it can't be done? I got pregnant at 43. The doctors all told me I was going to have a Down syndrome baby. In that moment, I had to choose. Am I going to listen to the doctor's voice or am I going to listen to the Lord's voice? And I said, if you will not speak words of faith, do not speak to me at all. I'm not kidding. I said it to him. He looked at me like, wow, this, this chick is kind of crazy. I'm like, you, you think whatever you want to think. <laughs> but he saw, I was crying and I, I reprimanded my doctor. I'm like, if you do not speak words of faith over me in life, I will never come back to your office. I will have this baby in my bed. Forget going to the hospital. Happened for years without doctors. The Lord can do this. And he's like, he informed his entire office. <laughs> do not bring up that subject anymore. Right. You got to attack the giants. Whose voice are you going to listen to? What voices are you listening to? If you listen to negative statements long enough, you get negative. That's why we're always on the kids. What are you putting into your brain? What are you listening to right now? Is it a positive message? You wonder why you're grumpy and you're funky and you're down and you're downhearted? Well, listen to the stuff you're listening to on the radio. We rarely watch the news. It's depressing. I know if there's something major that I need to know about, I'm going to hear from somebody. I don't need to watch the news for that. Right? We have to guard what we're listening to. Sometimes you just need a fresh pair of eyes and a fresh pair of ears. Can I get an amen? In verse 23 and 24, it says, As David talked with his brothers on the front line, he saw Goliath starting start shouting his usual threats to Israel's army. When the army heard Goliath, they all ran and away in terror. Don't hang out with fearful people. David didn't hang out with the people who were cowering on the side. He was like, whoa, this guy is defying the Lord's army. What's up with that? We got to do something. Okay, and later you're going to find out that his brothers were not too happy with David because he was speaking up, Okay. But first, before we get there, write in your notes, number three, the next giant you might uh, face is disapproval. Disapproval. We want everyone to like us. But you're always going to have naysayers. You're always going to have critics. You're always going like, to have people who don't like what you're trying to do. When we first became worship ministers, we had a dream, my husband and I, of raising the standard of excellence in worship. That's a good dream, wouldn't you agree? Do you know that we were very unliked? That's a righteous dream. And a lot of people did not like Glenn and I. They spoke poorly about us, man. I, I never took so many knives in the back ever. You know, and I was like telling Pastor Mike, like, I'm telling you, these people don't like me. Oh, it's all in your head. It's all in your head. I'm like, it ain't in my head. It reminded me of my dad who told me, I was telling my dad, I feel sick. I feel car sick. I feel so car sick. Oh, it's all in your head, Teresa. It's all in your head. Blech. Well, it's all in your car now. Same thing happened in ministry. I kid you not. I was telling Glenn, I was telling Pastor Mike, they don't like me, they don't like me. Don't like no, 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 it's all in your head, it's all in your head. And one day, we were right before Easter service now, we're on stage, and this woman was like, Rah! and I was like, <laughs> she attacked me publicly. And I was just standing there. I was like, whoa. Pastor Mike said, guess it wasn't all in your head. <laughs> guess we might want to do something about that. I'm like, you think? You think? <laughs> you know, but hey, it's okay. 
It's okay. I, that's all right. People disapproved of me. I wasn't looking for man's approval. I was, look, I was approved by the Lord already. And it was on his heart that we don't give him leftover in our worship. It's on his heart that we give our best, that we serve him with excellence. Can I get an amen? I know you as a congregation. Do you want us up here going, or, you know, or do you want to hear a joyful noise? You want it to be pleasant and pleasing to the ear, right? That's why there's a ministry for everybody. If you can't sing, that's all right. We'll find a ministry for you. It's okay. But we're not going to lower our standard because you want to fit into the ministry. Are you with me? We're not going to say it's okay not to have a rehearsal because you want to wing it. It's not okay. Jesus didn't wing it on the cross. The last time I checked, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he bled, sweat, bled, blood. I mean, he was prepared when he went to the cross. Can I get an amen? So we should be prepared when we come. Now, not to be legalistic, and I'm just using that as an example, because when we took over the ministry team back 14 years ago, all but one person quit. One person stayed. David Alvarico. He's still in our church, praise God. And I think he still likes us. Okay? But you might face disapproval. And that hurts, because we want everybody to like us. You might have people question your motives. David had his brothers question his motives. They treated David with disdain and disgust and disregard. Because this is their little brother. They belittled him. In verse 28 to 29, it says, David asked, what's the reward for killing this Philistine and ending his disgraceful, disgraceful abuse? When David's older brother heard this, he burned with anger. David asked the question and his brother burned with anger and said, why are you even here anyway? Why aren't you taking care of your scrawny little flock or sheep? You cocky little brat. I know how deceit, conceited you are. Now what have I done, David said. Here's his brother berating him, disapproving of him. And little old David said, what did I do? What did I do? And David said, can I even ask a question? That's all I did was ask a question. Here's a fact for us to accept in our hearts. Sometimes, even our family does not want our dreams to succeed. And Glenn and I kept watch on this as our children were growing up. There is often civil rivalry. Sibling rivalry. Right? You hope that your children never compete with each other, but if you don't watch that, they will. <coughs> as a parent, you've got to be careful of that. And sibling rivalry can lead to resentment. It can, really, it can lead to a severed sibling relationship. It could lead to orphan spirit. It can, I can, I'm telling you, it can lead to a lot of things. And many of you can see these things sometimes. You, you go into a room, you see one child is constantly being praised, and the other child is constantly trying to get praise. Right? You praise one child, and the next thing you know, the other child is running in, like, look at me, look at me, look at me. And instead of realizing there's something going wrong in this child's heart, you get irritated with them because you think they're trying to just get all the attention. But in reality, they're hurt and they're wounded on the inside. And they don't know that they're doing this, right? So we have to accept that our family is not always going to want our dream, okay? Okay. When God gives you a dream, the others are afraid to attempt, you'll be misunderstood, you'll be misjudged, and you'll basically be bad-mouthed. But God gave you the dream, nobody else is willing to t attempt it, so what are they going to do? It's like two crabs in a bucket, they're going to pull you down. But this can be a dream buster, this can be a dream stealer, the disapproval of others. When David heard what his reward would be, He's like, I don't care if you disapprove. I'm going after the reward. What was the reward? The reward was wealth. The reward was he gets to marry the king's daughter. Another reward was he gets to be exempt for taxes for life. You mean he doesn't got to pay taxes for life? How would you like to never have to pay taxes again for the rest of your life? Oh, bro, I was like, oh, dang, that's, that's a lot of money. So he just saw the reward. He didn't care about all the giants. He's like, I'm going after this. That's my reward. I'm going to take it down. I'm taking, the, I'm taking the bugger down. You know, that's how confident he was, not in himself, but in the Lord. 
The last giant that David had to face, right in your notes, number four, doubt. We often will ask ourselves, am I capable and up to the task? Am I capable and up to the task? The expert doubted his ability. King Saul himself hears about David and sends for him. In verse 32 through 33, it says, don't worry about a thing, David told the king. I'll fight this Philistine. This is the king's response. He says, don't be ridiculous. There's no way you can go up against the Philistine. The king even doubted on this little boy. Like, there's no way you can do it. You're only a boy, and he's been a professional warrior all his life. You hear words like that, that's enough to make you start doubting yourself. Amen? Okay? But remember, what voice are you listening to? Are you listening to the Lord's voice or are you listening to the voices of your circumstances and the people around you? So how do you defeat the giants in your life? Well, there's four things that David did. I'm going to go through these very quickly because I want to get to a testimony that I think is important. Okay? Number one, write in your notes, remember how God helped me in the past. You must remember how God has helped you in the past. When you remember how God has helped you in the past, this is a confidence builder. You recall and you re recollect all of God's goodness to help you overcome. For Glenn and I in our house, we knew that God helped us buy a townhouse. We didn't do that on our own. So it helped us to build our faith to believe that he can get us a single family home, right? If you are looking for a job promotion, you might have found yourself many a times needing the right job and God has always came through and provided for you. He will provide for you again. And David always did that. In verse 36 to 37, it says, in protecting my sheep, I've killed both a lion and a bear. The Lord who delivered me from the teeth of that lion and the claws of that bear will surely now deliver me from this Philistine too. All right? Because he had saw the power of God protect him while he was shepherding the sheep, he knew that that same power, that same God with the same character is going to protect him now as he goes against the giant Goliath. In Psalm, and I'm not sure if this is in your notes, but in Psalm um, chapter 119, verses 11, in the message translation, 119, verse 11, this is what David says. I've banked your promises in the vault of my heart. David took all of the promise of God and he banked it in his heart. So when he needed it the most, he just took out of the bank. It's like going to the bank. You deposit so much into the bank that when you need money, you just go to the ATM machine and withdraw it. See, what's pro the problem with many of us is we're not banking anything in our heart. So when we are at, faced up against a wall and we're facing a giant, you don't have anything to take out of your bank to, to battle with. Are you with me? Okay. So David treasured all the promises. And because he knew the character and the nature of his God, he knew that the character and nature of God, his God would be faithful to him in that moment too. Number two, use the tools God has given me now. I must use the tools that God has given me now. We don't want to wait for something we don't have in order to move towards the promises we know God has given. Can I get an amen? If I would have waited to finish my theological degree before I planted the church in, in obedience, we wouldn't be here today. Because raising four children, running ministry, and trying to get my degree was going to take me a long time. I did not have time to take a full like load, like take, I don't know, what's, what is full course? How many classes is that? 19 units, seven classes. There is no way on God's planet I would be able to take seven classes a semester. That, I would be a basket case. You know, I believe C's get degrees. I would have been like D's. Okay, so it was, there's no way. But I didn't wait until I had all of my training and my teaching and I had my degree and I, all my ducks were in a row. I just moved out in obedience to do what I know God wanted me to do. Are you with me? So you need to learn to use the tools God has already given you. What do I have now that God has given me that I'm going to be able to achieve this? Maybe God is, you're going to ask for this job promotion and you feel a little bit underqualified. 
okay? You feel a little bit underqualified. Maybe you've not even been trained in the area of this job, but God is getting ready to give you this job. So what do you do? Not apply for the job? No, you apply for the job knowing that God makes able the person who is available. That's what happens. I didn't know how to plan a church. I never went to church planner school. I was asking for a church planning school. Pastor Mike, do you have a manual? Do you have a manual? No. You have the Holy Spirit. That's all you need. I'm like, that's all I need? Holy Spirit? Yeah, Teresa. Just ask the Lord. He'll tell you what to do. That's all we had. I'm like, okay. Even back then, God was building my faith. That wasn't enough for me. I needed something concrete. So I went online. I Googled church planting. And I found me a website that said church planters. I'm like, yeah, that's for me. So I pulled all my resources from there. All the while, God was like, you don't need that. You need my presence. You need my power. That's all you need. You know? But, you know, we do what we got to do. So you move out towards your dream knowing that God will provide a way for you to be equipped in the areas you need to be equipped so that you can do what he's calling you to do. Amen? Amen. Okay? <clears throat> what is the worst thing you can do is try and become something you are not just because you think you have to be that to accomplish the task. And that was imposed on David as well. In verse 38, it says, Then Saul, King Saul, dressed David in his own armor. Okay, so here's King Saul saying, Okay, little boy, I'm going to let you go battle this guy, but here, take my best armor. He gives him a sword, gives him all the heavy stuff he's got to wear. And David said, I, I cannot go out in these because I'm not used to them. Remember David is not a warrior. What is David? He's a shepherd. So he cannot go slay the giant trying to be a warrior. He has to go slay the giant being who he is. He is a shepherd. So what does he do? He takes all that armor off and he says, I'm going to be me. I'm not going to try and be somebody I'm not. I'm going to be all of who I am, all of who God has created me, and I'm going to use all of what God has given me. And what God has given me was my sling and some stones. So little boy picks up five smooth stones in his sling and he goes out to battle. And I'm sure all of the warriors are looking at him like, you are mad crazy. This little boy is going to his death. But I love that he did not try and become something he's not. You got to be who you are in whatever God's calling you to do. It's when you try to be somebody you're not, you fail. And David would have fell. If he would have tried to go hand-to-hand -hand combat with David, with Goliath, with a sword, he would have mocky done. He doesn't even know how to use a sword, right? So use what God has given you. Be fully who you are to move out in your destiny. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 4 says, if you, wait it, if you wait for perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. It's never going to be perfect. You're never going to have enough people in your ministry. You're never going to have enough volunteers. You're never going to have this. You're never going to have that. You're never going to have that. There's always going to be something. You still need to just get over that and move forward. Can I get an amen? Because why? I think God allows that stuff there because it requires for you to have faith. And that's the only thing that pleases him is to have faith. That's why he lets all those empty holes be unfulfilled. Because he's going to say, are you listening to me? Are you watching me? Are you trusting in me? Or are you trusting in the fact that you have all your ducks in a row? Right? Okay. Three. What else do you do? Well, you ignore the dream busters, the dream breakers, the dream stealers. Call it whatever you want. Okay. Ignore the dream breakers and the dream stealers. Interestingly, not one person encouraged David. Not one person. He says he's going to take out this giant. His brothers didn't encourage him. His father didn't encourage him. King Saul didn't even encourage him. You would think King Saul would have been his biggest cheerleader because he was going out there for King Saul. Even King Saul said, what are you talking about? You can't do this. Nobody believed in him. So what did David do? 1 Samuel chapter 30 verse 6 says, when others were speaking against him, David encouraged himself in the Lord. When nobody is for you, who can be against, when, when God is for you, who can be against you? It does not matter what everybody else is saying. 
All that matters is what the Lord is saying. When nobody is believing you, when you've been passed up for promotion, when you've been working your hiney off for so long and everybody is ignoring you because this young pup comes in. When you've been faithful in ministry and they promote somebody else to be the worship leader, whatever. I'm just throwing out things that might bother people. Okay? Whatever it is, what do you do? You have to learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. When everybody spoke out against me because I wasn't as friendly as Pastor Glenn, because I was the truth speaker. I was a truth speaker. I mean, I was like, the truth hurts, but I'm still going to speak the truth. I'm not going to lie to you. This is truth. And you don't have to like me. It's okay. Because I'd rather be disliked by man and be pleasing to the Lord. I, I, we're not in a popularity contest. You don't got to like me. I just need to go to bed at night knowing that I did exactly what my Father in heaven has instructed me to do. Jesus wasn't trying to win a popularity contest either. If you remember, lots of people didn't like him. But what did he do? He ignored all those naysayers. I had to ignore the naysayers. I had people in our congregation calling me a cheerleader. She's just a cheerleader. That's all she is. That's not worship. I'm just like, I'd crawl back into my prayer closet crying. <laughs> Am I just a cheerleader, Lord? Is that what I'm doing? I, I'm not trying to be a cheerleader. I, I thought I was worshiping the Lord, but you know, God, this is what they said about me. And I'm like crying and I'm in the bathroom crying. And I'm just like, and the Lord was like, you are my beloved. I delight in you. I have called you for such a time as this. I mean, this is what the Lord is downloading to me. Stand righteous in me, child of mine. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Shake myself off and I'm right back up there. Come on, church. We're going to worship the Lord because he's worthy of it. <laughs> Call me a cheerleader. Call me whatever you want. I'll do a kick for you. <laughs> If that's going to make you get your butt up and worship the Lord, then that's what it's going to take in Jesus' name. <laughs> because my job here is to get you into the throne room of grace. And I'm not going to stop. I will not relent until the people of God come and give him worship that is worthy for him. We will not be a people who give him praise with our mouth, but our hearts are far away. We will not, not on my watch. <laughs> because that's who I was created to be. And I had a lot of naysayers. I had to ignore those people. You're going to have to ignore them. What I'm talking here is far more than positive mental attitude. Okay, I'm not just talking about pump yourself up with a positive mental attitude. I'm talking about going into the throne room of grace before your daddy is saying, Lord, this is what they're saying to me. I am discouraged. I am downright. I am disheartened. I am lonely. I am fearful. I am all of this and allowing for the anointing of God to fill you and strengthen you. That's how you strengthen yourself in the Lord. That is mano a mano, one on one. I cannot do that for people. Even my children, I cannot, I cannot. I, I, every time I know my children are struggling, I can see it. As a mom, you just know, right? Hey, mom, you know. And I see them struggling, and I would say to them, are you battling in your mind? Good. And I walk away, and immediately I intercede. I'm like, God, help them overcome this. Help them overcome the lies of the enemy in their mind right now. In Jesus' name, send a legion of angels to warfare for them. Because I, I cannot do it for them. They got to do it, right? They have to ignore all of the negativity that's trying to come at them. And finally, write in your notes, expect God to help me for his glory. Expect God to help me for his glory. I'm sorry, I know that's a long blink. In verse 45 to 47, it says, David shouted to Goliath, you come at me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord Almighty. Today, the Lord will conquer you. Who's going to conquer Goliath? The Lord is going to conquer Goliath. David is not even taking any confidence in himself. 
He's not saying, I'm going to conquer you. He's saying the Lord is going to conquer you. And the whole world, and this is it, church, underline this. This is it. This is the magic. This is the power. And the whole world will know that there is a God. This is why God delivers you. This is why God moves for you. It's not for you. It's because he wants the whole world to know there's a God. There's a God almighty. There's the one true God. He wants everybody to know that there is a God. And everyone will know that the Lord doesn't need weapons to rescue his people. It is his battle, not ours. The Lord will give you to us. The Lord will give you to us. God is going to help you take down your giants for his glory. If you remember that this is crucial, if you're going to God and begging him to do something for you and for your glory, it is never going to happen. You're not going to win that battle. But if you get on your face before God and say, Lord, I know that this is for your glory. I know, and Moses did this a lot, but if this doesn't happen, what will they say about this God that I serve? Okay? I know, God, that you're going to make a way for us to buy more than a half a million dollar house in the state of Hawaii on a pastor's salary. I know you're going to do it because you want to be glorified. And you know that we will give you testimony. And we will tell everybody, we didn't do this. God moved mountains for us and we got this house. I can't tell you how many, not only did he deal with the financial obstacle, he also moved mountains because there was already an offer on this house. There was an offer on the house when we put an offer in. I found out later it was contingent. They needed to sell their townhouse before they can finish their contract with the seller. We had already sold our townhouse, so they gave the, these people two weeks. You have two weeks to get an offer on your house. If you don't get an offer on your house in two weeks, we're going to close contract with you, and we're going to open contract with them. So we opened contract with them. It took us, now hear me, I'm only sharing this because this, would, this is a giant now. Three months to close on this house. Normally, you close on your house in 30 to 60 days, right? 45 days in the middle. Three, 90 days to close on this house. Talk about a delay. 90 days of us commuting through traffic, which I cannot stand traffic, which is why I don't work in town. 90 days of us doing couple A traffic to get our kids to school. 90 days of getting up at 6 in the morning to get our kids to school by 8. 90 days of wondering, is this ever, does this house thing? And let me tell you, we started to doubt. I was like, God, maybe we're not supposed to have this house, Glenn. Maybe we're not supposed to have this house because it's too difficult. If it, if it, was, it was God's will, it would be easy. Let me tell you, sometimes God wants difficult because he's trying to build our faith. And God checked me. He's like, are you giving up already? You gave up already on me. And I had to repent, no, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm not going to give up on you. I'm not going to give up on you. We had obstacle after obstacle. But that 90 days was all a part of God's plan because we needed 90 days to get our paperwork in order. For whatever reason, the military couldn't find Glenn's paperwork that qualified us for a VA loan. I have no idea why they don't have him on the books. You all know how long he's been working for the military. They couldn't find him in the system. So our finances wasn't in order. But at the same time, there was a building permit issue. That became a blessing in disguise because that building permit issue gave us the time to find that paper that they needed to get our VA loan financing in order. And I remember it was closing on this loan and I'm thinking, okay, all kinds of giants and I, I already had my power with God because he's like, are you giving up on me? You need to believe. And I was like, okay, God, I believe, but you need to tell me what to do. We need to move some mountains. We need to knock down some giants. We need to just come at it with some slingshot and some stones. And I remember praying that morning, and he said, call Pam Goya. I said, okay, I'm just going to call Pam Goya. I called Pam Goya. I said, Pam, this is what's going down. I said, I don't know what to do. And for those of you that know Pam, she is a monster of a woman of God that is, knows how to deal with the military. I said, Pam, I don't know, I don't know what to do, but we're going to lose this house if we don't find this paperwork, and God told me to call you. She said, Pastor Teresa, don't worry about it. I'll call you right back. Within hours, this woman had everybody calling me. <laughs> I called this person. They called me. I said, I called that person. And I was like, look, I, you know, and I'm like going off. I said, if I have to call the reporters, I'm going to call. I'm going to call everybody I have to call 
because we lost this house because you guys are robbing my husband of his rights and he has served his country lo- far too long for you to take away his right. After that, a colonel called me. Ma'am, we got you. Don't even worry about it. And Pam said, Teresa, call this person. I called and I said, Pam Goya. I said, I called this person. This this. Said, wait, 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 wait. Let me call Jody. She called Jody and within seconds, somebody called me back. Ma'am, we got your paperwork done. We are not going to lose your house. Not on our watch. I, that's all it took. And it was call Pam Goya. <laughs> I'm like, what is she going to do? Take on the general? I'm, I, uh, whatever. I'm like, okay, God, I'm not going to ask questions. I'm just going to do what you told me to do. Two weeks later, we were in this house. Two weeks later, done. I'm just like, wow, are you serious? The permit got done after we moved in. They called me on the phone at 6 o'clock in the morning. I'm thinking, who in the world is calling me at 6 o'clock in the morning? I answered, and they're like, ma'am, da 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 yeah, okay, what about this and that? I'm like, well, what is it? He's like, don't even worry about it. Put up some fire alarms and I'm going to just approve it. I'm like, really? You don't got to come out and look? He's like, no, I'm not going to look. I'm going to send you your permit. I'm like, praise Jesus, it's done. We're done. We're in our house. Hallelujah. Okay, that's my testimony. I want to give you one more testimony. I know we're going long today. But I believe testimony builds faith. Can I get an amen? And this is fresh testimony. Okay, mine's a, a month old because we got in our house maybe a, a month and a half ago. I'm going to call up, um, this is not planned. Cindy, Cindy Schrock is coming up. Which, Vance, which microphone can she use? Which microphone do you want Cindy to use? This one? Okay. Yeah, okay, you guys. This was, we made this up this morning. We were praying, and I'm like, I said, God, I want another testimony. I don't want it to just be me and my testimony. Like, I want somebody in this fellowship that has a fresh testimony. And he's like, he's like, bam, Cindy. I'm like, oh, yeah. So I asked her in prayer, and she agreed. And everything that we talked about, okay, she's gone through. And this testimony is going to show you that this is truth, and God will move for you. She faced a delay. She was discouraged, okay? She felt disapproved. Okay, and you're going to know why. She felt how many disapprovals. Okay, then she had doubt. She started to question herself after all these disapprovals. She's thinking, what the heck? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm not supposed to do that. But then she went on a journey. She remembered how God helped her in the past. And when she couldn't remember, she surrounded herself with godly people to help her remember. Tip. When you are down and out, you need to call on some brothers and sisters that will build you up, not tear you down. Can I get an amen? Okay. She, she's using what she has because she's going to share with you where, she, where God has her. And probably a little scary where she's going because she wasn't ready for this. This wasn't what she thought she was getting. But I knew in my spirit, I said, Cindy, this is it. You are going to be outstanding in this. I know that I know you were created for this. She ignored the circumstances. She ignored the naysayers. And she expected God to do this for his glory. She is, she is a walking testimony. And this happened this past week. Yes. It came to fruition. So go ahead and share that. Um, Long story short, I actually finished my bachelor's degree in counseling in 2009 um, and waited a year to start um, looking for a job. And um, in the DOE, there's only certain seasons you can look for a job. And if once those seasons are passed, like, you're done. You have to stay where you're at. And so um, every year I would pray about which schools to look at. Um, I looked at teaching jobs. Um, I tried... I'm a high school teacher. I'm a business teacher certified. So, but I was like, Lord, I'll do anything, like anywhere to get where I felt like the Lord was calling me. My dream was to be a counselor that the Lord gave me. Um, Applied for any job that the Lord highlighted. So applied elementary schools, middle schools. um, And along the way, every door was closed. And there were schools that never even responded at all. Um, There were times where I thought, I don't know if this is the right thing, but um, this past week, I my, had my last interview um, at a school that I, I'm going to be honest with you, I, I didn't want to go to that complex because I kept saying to the Lord, I don't think that's the safe complex for me to go to. Um, there are other schools, right, God, that you're going to lead me to. But one thing after another, this past season, I... Um, I applied for two schools in the first round, and I didn't get any of those. And I remember in between that, I saw Pastor Teresa, and I looked at her with such discouragement, and I said, I don't think I'm supposed to apply anymore. And, she, you know, my husband is, keeps encouraging me. You know, we had others. I, that was the one thing I think I did differently this year is 
I told Jeff, I think this time I need to invite the body of Christ in to help me. Um, other than that, I, I would literally tell Jeff, you can't tell anybody where I'm applying because I can't deal with the no. I can't deal with people knowing that I got another no. Like that's where I was. Um, and he would, he would have to swear to me. He's not going to tell people. But this year um, in late March, we, we asked people, we said, you know, we need, we need to ask your help because the Lord had brought me to a point where it was, I knew it was only his favor that would get me into this position. Like he had to strip me of my own dream and my own goals. And it really, I really had to say, Lord, it's only your favor that'll open the door because I've been told no for the past five years. Um, so this season I, I've had three schools again. Um, and the first one I thought, ah, this is the one. Nope. Um, the second one I thought, oh, okay, God, are you calling me there? Okay, I will go. And for me, I think that was the ultimate place of surrender. Like if you're going to call me back there, I will have to go knowing that you're calling me for your glory only. Because I don't really want to go back to that school where I was at once before. Um, and then this last school, I just thought, oh Lord, please help me get one of these other two jobs because I don't even want to go to that interview. Like, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to lie to you. But every, again, every door was closed. But what the Lord did was that second interview that I had, the Lord really opened it up where that principal is somebody who could speak into my life. Mm -hmm. And I asked him for feedback. Tell me, like in a sense, what am I doing wrong, right? If I've been told no this many times. And he encouraged me. He said, don't be discouraged. And he even helped me get some insight into this school. So I went to an interview on Tuesday, Wednesday afternoon. IAEA High School called me and offered me um, their college and career counselor. And I have to tell you that um, mm -hmm. that is a job that I didn't even ask the Lord for because that's like the ultimate dream. And I thought, I got to get, you know, I got to get in an elementary school or I got to just do regular counseling first. Like, I don't even want to ask God for that one. And he literally gave me that out of the blue. And I remember telling Jeff, um, yes, it's totally God. Because I remember telling Jeff, it's, I didn't even know when I applied that it was a college and career job. I was like, I just thought it was a regular counseling job. I was like, Jeff, are you, are you serious? Really? He's like, don't put God in a box. Amen. I'm like, but that's like going from zero to 60. He's like, just go with it. I'm like, oh. um, but the Lord has truly opened the door and has really helped me see where this is where he's calling me. He's completely closed the door to Radford where I'm at. And, and just like the principal is opening me with, you know, with open arms. Um, the vice principal is a former colleague. And he just, it, it just all these pieces that God has truly helped me see where in all those other instances I thought they were no's mm -hmm. and I could have given up mm -hmm. and it was that close that I if I would have given up in the beginning of April I would have completely missed this golden opportunity that I've been waiting for again seven years since I finished my master's so I know it's totally God so I'm going to go with faith that he's going to do what he wants me to do there because if I don't walk it out with him then then it's not you know it's not going to happen. Yeah. So I have to go just trusting God that this is where he's calling me. He will go before me and the rest I will trust him with. Cause Amen. We'll Amen. See what Amen. He does, right? Thank you. I am so excited about that testimony because let me tell you, brothers and sisters, there are other things that I'm sure both Jeff and Cindy are dreaming about. God doesn't give you one dream and then you fulfill it and then you're done. You know what I mean? He, he keeps giving you more and more things that you're hoping for. But the testimony of her watching God's goodness be achieved in this area is now going to build her faith to believe that he's going to move on her behalf on this area. Are you with me? Everything is going to build your faith. Everything is going to be better than what you can even imagine. We were going to settle for a house in Eva. I told many of you that because we thought we're never going to afford a home in Mililani. We started looking in Eva. And God found us this home in Milani. I'm telling you, I'm like, wow. When the kids saw the house, they hated it. It's okay. <laughs> Family member, eh? I felt so defeated. I was so discouraged. I almost cried. I'm like, oh, no, I thought this was a house. The kids hate it. What are we going to do? And then I'm like, whatever, God. I know this is our house. We're just going to move forward. I'm going to trust you. They're, they'll learn to love the house. You'll change their heart right? 
and not too long ago, once you, you start putting your own touch on it, you start to change things. We change the floor, we're painting, we're doing all these things, right? And not too long ago, Brayden wakes up and he's walking around the house and he comes to me, he's like, mom, this is a beautiful house. I'm like, aren't you glad of God's goodness that he didn't give us what we thought we wanted? He not only gave us a beautiful home, he put you five minutes away from your high school. You can literally roll out of your bed and walk over there and be there on time, right? But it's according to your faith. Without faith, nothing's going to happen. Matthew 9, 29, according to your faith, will it be done to you? Y you got you to gotta believe. God will use people to build your faith. And I remember when I talked to Cindy, and it was just last Sunday. She was ready to tap out last Sunday. I'm like, whoa. And she's like, well, you know, Pastor, and she's sharing her heart. I said, Cindy, you don't have hope in your job. You don't have hope that you're going to get the job. Your hope is never in that. Your hope is in the goodness of the Lord. Your hope is in his character. Your hope is in his nature. That whatever he does is going to blow your mind. Because he wants you to have the right job at the right time with the right money attached to it for his glory. Because look how much glory she just gave him by giving her testimony. And she's going to be used to help somebody else believe for their breakthrough in their area. Maybe it's a work thing. Maybe it's a, you know, whatever it is. She, her faith is going to build somebody else's faith. With that, would you close in as we close? Would you stand as we close in prayer? If you're here this evening, this morning, and you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, that's where it all begins. You got to put your hope in Jesus Christ. That's where the journey of faith begins. With every eye closed and every head bowed, if you're here and you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, would you raise your hands? We want to pray for you. If you're here this morning and maybe you're facing some giants in your life. Maybe it's a job thing. And that job is holding you back. It's not allowing you to become and do what you need to do for God's glory. It's been a discouragement to you. It's been heavy on your heart. It's toxic. Maybe you're here and it's a relational issue. Maybe it's an emotional issue. Maybe it's a financial issue. Whatever your giant is, if you're here this morning and you're facing giants, would you raise your hand? We want to pray for you. Hallelujah. The goodness of the Lord is that we don't face these giants alone. Not only do we have the Lord on our side, we have the body of Christ to support us as well. So Heavenly Father, we come into your presence right now. We thank you, Father, for your example in the Word of God on how to overcome these giants in our lives. Father, we don't want to be a people who tap out before we reach the fulfillment of our dreams. We don't want to be a people who get discouraged or dismayed and never accomplish your perfect will. Never walk into the full blessings that you have in store for us and receiving all of your promises. And so we ask now, Father God, that you would build our faith that you would encourage us, that you would strengthen us, O oh Lord, in you. Father, help us to run into your warm embrace to find encouragement, to finish the race that you've set before us, whatever that race may be, knowing that that is not the end, that's just the beginning for what we will do and accomplish for your greater glory. Father, I pray that you would lead each and every one of us to the people that we need to surround ourselves with to be encouragers, to be edifiers, to be uplifters, Father God, not naysayers. And we pray, Father God, that you would send your spirit to break us free of every stronghold that is trying to work against us. We say, Father God, do it. In the name of Jesus, bring those giants down, not for our sake, but for your greater glory, that you will be made famous throughout the land and that many will turn to you and seek you and come to know you as the good and awesome and mighty God that we know you are. Thank you, Father God, for the victory over our house. Thank you for the victory for Cindy's career path 
And now, Father, we say, do it again. Do it again on behalf of your children, Father God, in your name's sake, for your name's sake. And Father, we will rejoice and we will glorify and we will celebrate your goodness in the land of the living. So we thank and we praise you, Father God, and we ask all these things in your son's precious name, Jesus Christ. And all those in agreement said, amen, 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 amen. Would you put your hands together and thank the Lord? We're going to go out and singing a song of benediction. Alive. alive. Oh, yes, we are alive. Hallelujah. You are my free. 